Welcome, this is Money Heart, where we explore the emotional side of money. I'm Camille Diaz, and today we're discussing the transition checklist for the entrepreneur. My guest is John Alford. He's former Navy EOD, was an officer for 22 years, retired about 10 years ago, and has done a variety of defense contracting jobs since that time. He's also a regional leader with Five Rings Financial, and so he's a dual career entrepreneur. John, welcome to Money Heart. Hi, Camille. It's great to be with you today. Thanks. Uh, translate what I said there in the beginning and uh, tell us a little bit about your military career. Okay, I'd love to. Uh, Navy EOD stands for Explosive Ordnance Disposal, and that's a very fancy way of saying the bomb squad. Uh, if you remember the movie Hurt Locker or the TV show Bomb Squad Afghanistan, uh, I actually was in Iraq about the same time as the embedded uh, writer that wrote The Hurt Locker and uh, served in one of the units that was in Bomb Squad Afghanistan earlier in my Navy career. Uh, so basically, I was a, I was a bomb technician, explosive ordnance disposal officer, uh, got to lead various units, and as I mentioned, deployed to both Iraq and Afghanistan uh, in my time in the Navy and as a defense contractor. Wow, very cool. I like it. Okay, so what were things like for you when you got out? Because we're kind of talking about that transition from switching from being in such an, an organized place and then getting out into, I almost want to call it the real world. I don't know if that's accurate. <laughs> it, 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 is, it is definitely the real world uh, to, to more people that, than, uh, that serve in the military. Uh, and that was one of the big transitions because I went straight from college. Actually, I went straight from high school to college and college to the military. I had never even written a resume. And one of the good things about serving in the military is everything is very uh, rigid and codified. You know what your pay grade is. You know how much you're going to get paid. You know when your next pay raise, either due to seniority or promotion, is most likely going to happen. And everyone is getting just about the same pay and benefits. Um, even though my first transition was from the military to a defense contracting company, where I already knew about half the workforce, I didn't know how it worked on how our contracts got paid, the variety of pay, all the different benefits, because in the military, that's all pretty much all in paper for you. So it was, it was a learning curve there. Fortunately, I had some people that had retired before I had uh, that did not work for that company. They were able to be sounding boards and mentors, and I could ask them a lot of questions. That's a really nice thing to have. Um, <laughs> I imagine it's a little bit intimidating when you come out and haven't had to deal with that before. Kind of how did that strike you or how did you feel about it? It, it was. Uh, even with all those people that had walked the path before me, uh, there was some uncertainty and, you know, was I asking a fair price both for myself, uh, but also for, for what the companies could afford uh, so that I wouldn't be the first person laid off if we lost a contract. <coughs> Excuse me, I, just had to, I had to call for just a second. Sorry. Don't worry. So it was, you know, there were, there were some things that I already knew and I had an idea going in, but then there were also certain uh, things that I, I didn't know. And, you know, having to go from a set pay to a, to a band or a scale that was negotiable was a very big difference. Yeah, I would think that it's, um, it's very different having to negotiate a salary or a contract if you haven't ever had to do that before. Um, I guess most of us sort of learn that when we start job hopping in our, you know, early 20s or something like that. Um, when did you have to acquire those skills? That's a, that's a very good point, Camille. When I first uh, thought about retiring from the Navy, I was already in my 40s and actually retired after my 44th birthday. So you're exactly right. Things that some of my peers from college had already gone through a number of times. You know, here I was uh, actually twice as far down my life. I graduated from college at 22. It was another 22 years before I had even written a resume and had to figure out, okay, what is the market for someone with my skill set? Right, right. So how did your first 
times doing that go was a little rough? Did, were you a fast learner? I'm just kind of curious how that, how that ended up. It, it definitely didn't go rough. I was very blessed that when I retired as an EOD officer, you know, the challenge was we were right in the middle of the wars and there were contracts and jobs for us. But it, there were also some very stark realizations that, you know, in the military, you're all part of this large organization where the defense contractors I worked for, even though we were all working for the same company, we were actually working for specific contracts and projects. And even inside those contracts, things like pay and how we could build the government weren't the same. And I knew nothing about that for my first six months or so working for this company uh, and slowly learned those things as I went along. Yeah. So at the beginning, we mentioned transition checklist, kind of update those who haven't ever left the military on what that means. What's a transition checklist? What, how does it work? Yeah, Camille, thanks for asking. And, and what I mean by the transition checklist is uh, because people are always leaving the military, either their, their initial term of service is over, their enlistment, their second enlistment, or they choose to retire after a full career, uh, we generally pass down and have accepted checklists of all the things that you have to do. It would be just like leaving a company after a career and you have to go to HR but because so much of our life is inside there, like our medical benefits, our family benefits, there's all these checklists of things to do, but they're all very cut and dried things about administrative things. It's the mindset that, that they don't really talk to us about, that differences of being a private citizen working for a private company and you know, not having everything codified where in two years you become more senior or you know, this is what everybody gets paid for doing this kind of work. And, and the mindset was something that even having some people mention to me, I was not as prepared for. Mm, yeah, I could see how that would be kind of a hard thing because I guess when you whether you go to work as a contractor in the private sector or you start a small business, there isn't really a list of things to make sure that you do. There kind of is. I mean, you can look it up online and, and get a feel for what to do, but there's nobody really saying, here's what to do for exactly what you're trying to accomplish. Go down the list. Right. Exactly. And, you know, the, the counterpoint is, is our society has become more fluid people do job hop and even career hop, uh, they, they do that in a, in a different system. Where in the military, where in the Navy, for 22 years, I had different orders. So I didn't do the same thing for 22 straight years. It was all inside the explosive ordnance disposal community, but it was for the same company. And I had never learned how, you know, how to take care of those things, how to, you know, get Let's just face it. I didn't know how to get medical and dental uh, insurance ID cards for my wife and our kids because we just always went to the base clinic or base dental um, and, and how that changed from one company to the next as I changed contractors where other people may have already done that three or four times by the time they're in their mid forties. Uh, but you're never too old to learn. You're never too old to, you know, show some humility and ask questions. I think that's a fantastic point because it is a lot of humility and that to, to be able to ask questions about things that most people learned when they were 25 and now you're 45 and you're asking those questions and yeah. uh, how's the response when somebody's, you know, say, let's say you're getting insurance. Like you said, you, you have to get medical insurance because you got to go sign up through this new contract and then they're telling you all about deductibles or co-insurance or whatever yeah. it is. And, and this is the first <laughs> time you've ever had to deal with that. How did people react? Like, were they helpful? Did you have to explain why you were confused? Like, how did that, how'd that go? Yeah. Well, I mean, most, most people were very helpful. And, and I had to smile earlier as we started talking about humility because, you know, and I know I'm guilty of this as well. Not very many career military people are sometimes good at practicing humility. I mean, some of, our, some of our greatest leaders are, and that's what makes them the great leaders. But, you know, most people, uh, and I found this true across all 
types of segment of society, not just the military, not just uh, healthcare providers, but you know, when you do truly ask a question and, and, and want to, to get help and, and don't walk in there like, I know everything and you have to help me. And, you know, they, they're, they've been very helpful. Uh, and, and again, most people do want to do a good job. Most people want to help someone else. It's, it's kind of how we're made as human beings is, is that desire to, to actually help somebody who is honestly in need or seeking uh, information. Um, but, but it was different because some of it was also knowing where to, you know, where to go to get the right answer. Uh, again, because the military is so structured and rigid, you, you immediately knew, well, this office does that. And there were times where I would call uh, people inside this def first defense contractor and they would be like, well, I'm not really the person you're supposed to talk to. I can help you out, but then I've got to transfer you. And I just didn't, you know, it, it's not, everything's not right there uh, like it is in the military where everything is on your chest and on your name tag and in your office code. Uh, but, but again, people were helpful. Uh, and then it's kind of the way we continue in the military. Like I got the transition checklist from people who were retiring a couple years before I retired. The same thing happens at a lot of these defense contracting companies where, you know, the more experienced people that we knew from our military time say, Hey, let me, you know, and then I later helped onboard new hires as well. Right. So training the next generation sort of, of how this all works and, and how, how to cope. Yeah. But, you know, as Camille, you and I've talked about, uh, you know, since we, since we are friends and, and partners in, in one of the businesses, um, you know, very different though, when, when I started investigating becoming an entrepreneur and even convincing myself that, that I could be an entrepreneur after, you know, spending my entire working life in very, in either military or military related uh, businesses. Yeah, absolutely. Because, um, you know, military super structured. And when you get out of that and you switch to something that's an entrepreneurial thing, you're just, you're on your own. It's <laughs> well, good luck. Have a, have a nice time. <laughs> <laughs> and it's probably the same for anybody coming out of education because um, school districts and universities are all fairly structured in how many degrees you've earned and how many years of service you have. And that's what determines your pay and that that types of thing. Um, sometimes nonprofits or um, unions, you know, have a very yeah. set structure of how your pay and everything like that is determined. Um, and then when we go to this entrepreneur thing, it's, well, here's the business you want to start. <laughs> Good luck. <laughs> yeah, I, yeah. And, you know, and, and not knowing every possible business opportunity out there, but, you know, there, there's some where you're, you're in a structure that, that has built in mentorship and coaching, but I'm sure there's some where it's just like, you know, I want to do this. And are you going to do it out of your house? Are you going to do it by yourself? Are you, you know, are you transitioning from something that you did? Like some of my friends became consultants or independent contractors after their time in the military. And I know some people like you mentioned that are a uh, union or educators that may do the same thing. Uh, my mother actually tutored and, but it wasn't through the school. It wasn't after school at the school. It was at our dining room table. And, and I never thought that was entrepreneurial until a few months ago. And then I realized my mom, who would view herself as an administrator or a school teacher, was actually an entrepreneur and built her own business there. Now, she didn't hire other people to tutor and get a small amount of override or anything, but, but you know, the same thing. She, she had to go get an accountant and figure out how to do small business taxes. And, you know, here she had been a school teacher, like you mentioned, very structured, seniority-based and education-based system. So, it's not just the military folks, but, but you're right. The transition to uh, being an entrepreneur, unless you happen to have that E chromosome, you know, it's, it's, it's kind of frightening. Yeah. Not just from, not just from the whether or not I can make it point. It's, am I doing everything I'm supposed to be doing? You know, do I have the, the right licenses and legal structure and checking accounts and, <laughs> yes, all the things, all the things. 
And, and then, and like you brought up earlier, you have to go get your own health insurance and your own life insurance and your own, you know, um, liability insurance. If you've got, you know, building or maybe if you have a license to protect and, and make sure all your stuff is secure and that you don't get hacked and that your office doesn't get broken into and <laughs> that you can fill orders on time. <laughs> yeah. And, and you're right. And, you know, it's, uh, you know, having, having been in a few entrepreneurial environments, uh, primarily in the financial services world, uh, a little bit of, of marketing as well, but, but that's just kind of playing more than anything. But, you know, I've been fortunate that, that two or three mentors with a previous company and, and now the company that I do work with, Dual Career, uh, they have a very strong mentoring culture. And I would say anyone who is considering becoming an entrepreneur or maybe floundering a little bit, they, they look for that as, as, as to me, that's a, as much a part of the culture. The culture is as much of what you should be looking for than the compensation package. If all you look at it is the compensation package, but you don't have mentorship, you know, as Camille, as you pointed out, you know, you have a license to protect or liability to protect. Um, and I don't want to just focus on the negatives. I mean, the mentorship is also a very positive, but, but I've been very fortunate that there have been some people that have that have patiently let me become less and less military and truly discover uh, entrepreneur um, type mentality and things like that. I think that's a fantastic point of how important it is to find someone or a group with a with a great culture, whether you're doing contract work or you're joining uh, an organization or you're, even if you're just out on your own, starting your own business, finding that coach or that mentor or somebody who can help walk you through those challenges of how do you negotiate for things? How do you think about your money? Are you going to be profitable? How do you hang in on those days when you go, man, <laughs> this is rough. <laughs> I think that's super important. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, exactly. And then how do you you know, when is it time, like some of the questions that I had to ask, do I need to incorporate? If I do, when do I incorporate? Does it make sense uh, to, to stay a sole proprietorship or, you know, just work this as a, as a, you know, independent business? Uh, you know, when do I, you know, how much money do I have to pour back in into this business model? And every, and every industry is going to be different. Uh, you know, financial services, uh, we really don't have a lot of overhead, something like, uh, like one company I'm familiar with, uh, J-Dog Junk Removal. They're, they're a very military-friendly franchisee. Uh, they're partnered with a bunch of military transition organizations. But, you know, to, to run J-Dog, you've got to have two or three trucks and multiple trailers, and you're going to have employees. That's a whole different, I mean, that's a great business if that's what motivates you and, and lights your fire but that's going to be completely different than if you come to work with our company or you go to work for Keller Williams or another real estate company, or you're an independent contractor uh, working for the defense industry instead of working for one of the large contractors, but you're still entrepreneurial. All those are different models. And yes, the, the nuts and bolts of paying your bills and having insurance, health insurance, life insurance, those kind of things are similar because we're grownups but how the business is structured and how you take, you know, do you pay yourself a salary? Do you just take profit? There, there's a lot there. And it's, it's very different than coming out of one of these structured school, hospital, union, military type environments. Right. Right. So I guess um, to kind of loop back to the, the feelings around that, I would think it, it's a little scary to be an entrepreneur <laughs> and you really have to go for it. Whereas there's some security in that structured system, but maybe also the structure makes us want to be an entrepreneur. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, no, and, and definitely Camille, that on one hand, the, the shackle of I'm not going to get promoted for three more years or four more years or six more years, uh, and I might not get you know, screened and I might have to retire, all that is all. But at the same time, the fact that you know, you know, like in my situation being military, on the 1st and 15th of every month, a paycheck showed up and it was never going to vary. You know, it might go up. It's never going to go down. Um, 
you know, I have, to, I have a job to go do and my job because of the timing of it, you know, post nine 11, my community went to being at the forefront. Uh, we didn't hope for that. Uh, it was a very big mind change as well, but where is an entrepreneur, you know, do I want to go to work today? Well, I better go to work because if I don't make some calls and invite some people and follow up on policies, I'm not going to get paid. And, and it, it, it's interesting being dual career right now, looking at which one suits me better having a, a job. Now I can't go into it right now, like most people, but I am teleworking in my dual career defense contracting job. But I know my salary is going to stay about the same as long as I do that. And do I want to pursue, pursue the dual career, both because of some of the cultural things I talked about, but also the income could be very small. It could be extremely good. And, and all those things are there for the entrepreneur. Yes. Yes, they are. But you never know, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Well, this has been wonderful. Thank you so much yeah. for hanging out with me today. I truly appreciate it. No, it's great, Camille, and, uh, you know, hope you continue doing these and, and help a lot of people out with, uh, you know, both some of the nuts, nuts and bolts, but also the, the mindset and, and the heart uh, that comes with, you know, with pursuing your dreams and your passions. Absolutely. Thank you, John. Uh, if you guys want to get in contact with John, uh, you can reach him on Facebook or through his LinkedIn profile. His email is John Alford at five rings financial.com. And he's looking for veterans or former military folks who are looking to transition and just want to kind of chat about that and, and share experiences and resources. Thank you as well to all of our listeners and viewers. I'm your host, Camille Diaz. This show is sponsored by Serenity Financial, a five rings financial agency specializing in financial education living benefits, and guaranteed lifetime income. Today, our money mantra is, I feel comfortable asking questions about money. <laughs>